Well, greetings for everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar from our Family Friendly Earth Care series, um, Pollinator Diversity and Bee Lookalikes. Um, my name is Kelly Kunkel and I'm an Extension Educator in Health and Nutrition with the University of Minnesota Extension's Center for Family Development. And this is part of a series that we're doing on Family Friendly Earth Care. Our next Family Friendly Earth Care webinar is on Thursday at one o'clock and it's on foraging. So if you haven't registered, please do so. I'd like to thank our webinar producer tonight, um, Rick Meyer. And Rick is going to be monitoring the chat for questions. So as you have questions during the evening, please be sure to write them into, put them into the chat. He's also recording this webinar and you will be getting that recording um, after, in about a month after it's been cleaned up. So we we'll anticipating getting, uh, getting the recording. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Brooke Nikila manages bees and serves as the program manager for the Bee Squad's Pollinator Ambassador Program. She also gives pollinator talks to groups throughout the Twin Cities. Brooke first discovered her interest in bees while doing research at the University of Wisconsin Stout, where she completed her undergraduate degree in applied science with a concentration in biotechnology. Please join me in a virtual round of applause for Brooke. Thank you all for joining me this evening uh, to talk about pollinator diversity and bee lookalikes. As Kelly said, hold on, my slides are not advancing. Okay, there we go. Um, Kelly did a great job introducing me, so I'm not going to spend too much time um, talking about myself, but I am Brooke Nicola, the program manager for the U of M B squad um, and our pollinator ambassadors program. Um, and I work for the University of Minnesota B squad. Um, which is the outreach and extension portion of the B Lab. We are a diverse group of really talented people who come from many different backgrounds, and we all work together for a great cause, uh, bee health and pollinator education. So first, I'm just going to touch on some, some bee basics and why we should care about bees. So it's important to know about our native pollinators because they are the ones who are having kind of the most struggle right now. Um, and our wild bees or our native bees are better at pollination than the honeybees. Honeybees are just more efficient because they can fly further. Um, they can fly a couple miles versus um, half a mile, and they can move a little bit more pollen. So I have just a quick little quiz here, um, kind of a pre-quiz, I guess, to test our knowledge on bee lookalikes. So there are five insects up here, and I want you guys to tell me which one of the five is a bee. So you can unmute if you want, or you can type it in the chat, um, one through five. I'll give you guys a couple seconds, four, four. We got a lot of fours. Those, okay, four is a great guess, but it's wrong. And this is Kind of a trick question, not really. So number five is a cuckoo bee, um, which means that it doesn't build its own nest and collect its own pollen. It uses other bees' nests. So it kind of disguises itself um, and works its way into another bee's hive and kind of takes it over. It eats its pollen, lays its eggs in the nest. Um, so it was a little bit of a trick, but it's a cuckoo bee. And number four, number one, and number two are flies. Oh no. Flies are the trickiest. We'll talk about how you know. So what are bees? Bees are a spe specialized lineage of wasps. 
that somewhere down that that developmental line, they switch to using pollen and nectar um, rather than insect prey. So think of honeybees as kind of like the vegetarians. Their diet's made up of, of plants. So protein from pollen and carbohydrates from nectar. And then the wasps eat insects. So kind of the meat eaters. Um, they get their protein from insects that you can find on um, like your garden plants. So they eat garden pests and other soft bodied insects. So when most people think about bees, I feel like it's safe to say that most people think of honeybees, which are on the left, and bumblebees, which are on the right. But there are more than 4,000 species of bees in North America, with over 450 living right here in Minnesota. So a few of the most common are, are labeled up on the screen here, and we'll get a little more detail into those in a few slides. Uh, we know what kind of, you know, our approximate number of our native bee species due to rigorous data collection dating back many years. Um, and actually at the Bee Lab, we have a bee ID tech on, on our staff who seems to always be identifying new species of bees. So with all of this diversity comes a whole host of life history traits to understand, to help them succeed. And bees can be separated into two main groups. So I talked about our honeybees and our bumblebees, which are social insects, which means they live in a colony. Um, each bee kind of has its own job and they have a queen that lays the eggs. And then our solitary bees, which are a majority of those um, 4,000. And they complete their life cycles solo. Um, some of them kind of gather in, in groups, kind of nest near each other. But for the most part, they have their own nest and they build it. They lay the eggs. They collect the food all on their own. So if you can kind of see on this frame, um, Notice the various colors in bees. There's lots of different colors, um, lots of different shapes and sizes, and a lot of different places that they may carry pollen. So bees typically have thick, usually hairy bodies. Um, and they have some kind of way to carry pollen, whether that's a pollen basket on their back legs, or pollen carrying hairs. So you can see the bee in the middle that's a longhorned bee or a chap like bee, and they carry the pollen on their thighs. So you can see her back leg has a lot of thick hairs on it, kind of like cowboy chaps. Um, so we call them chap like bees. And there are other bees that carry pollen in their armpits. So we call them armpit bees. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those too. Um, but bees have hair on them somewhere. To carry that pollen back to their nest, they have long elbowed antennae and they have two sets of wings and they often fold them over their body when they're foraging on a flower. While they're on a flower, you'll actively see them gathering either pollen um, or nectar with their tongues. Almost all bees have stingers. However, typically our solitary bees aren't strong enough to be able to get that stinger to penetrate our skin. So one of the most common social insects is Apis mellifera or the honeybee. And there's a lot of facts out there about about honeybees, but I, I'm just going to share a couple of what I think are the coolest ones. So probably one of the most unique things about honeybees is that they have hairs on their compound eyes that are 
thought to help them gauge speed when they're flying. Um, and honeybees on their back, the female worker bees have a wide kind of flattened hairless spot on their back, um, their hind tibia, where they collect pollen. And we call those pollen baskets. And most of the time when you see honeybees out on the flower, they are the female worker bees. The males or drones are rarely seen outside of the hive. So honeybees are social insects. They live in a colony together with one queen um, and they live managed by beekeepers in these bee boxes, these hive bodies. Um, there's variations out there, but for the most part, like this is the classic um, honeybee hive. So the queen and brood will be in the bottom brood boxes and they store honey above them. So think kind of like an attic. And the more honey that comes in, and as long as they have space, they keep adding that honey um, to their hive. The queen is the only female in the colony um, that is actively laying eggs. And she lays approximately 2,000 eggs a day. These um, honeybees in the wild, you can see there's a couple pictures on the left. Um, honeybees in the wild live in tree cavities or in warmer climates. I believe the, the picture in the top with the wax panels was taken by Marla um, in Bermuda and warmer climates, they'll just build the wax panels on a tree like this. Um, so we, we don't get to see that here uh, very often. It's very rare. Um, but it, it's a really cool thing that they do is just build that comb. So Langstroth hives or those wooden hive bodies allow commercial beekeepers to more easily move their bees around the country for pollination services. So providing pollination services like going out to California to pollinate almonds in February is where commercial beekeepers uh, make their living. That's how they make their money. They get paid per colony um, to have their, their honeybees perform these pollination services. So most commercial beekeepers bring their bees to California in February for the almond bloom. And then from there, they may continue on. So they may move their bees um, to Washington or out east for different fruits. Um, or some of them will go down to Texas or the South um, to rear honeybee colonies or packages for other beekeepers, hobby beekeepers to buy um, or to raise queens to sell to uh, other beekeepers. And then in the summer, they tend to bring their hives back up to the Midwest um, where the colonies uh, make honey. So North Dakota is the number one honey producing state in the U.S. for like many, 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 many years. Um, Minnesota tends to sit about fifth on the list for honey production. And I believe Wisconsin is just right behind them. Someday, someday Wisconsin is going to beat Minnesota. I know it. Um, I'm from Wisconsin, so all of you Wisconsinites out there. So another social bee is the bumblebee. Bumblebees are medium to large in size. Typically they have some kind of pattern of yellow and black um, or orange reddish hair. Um, but it's not always, and it's usually kind of unique to species. So. Some species though actually have to be identified under a microscope uh, because some of their face um, patterns or dimensions um, is what tells them apart from species. So you can actually find this guide to Minnesota bumblebees on our website um, and I can share the link uh, after, but this guide kind of helps walk you through um, how to identify some of the bumblebees that you're seeing. Um, because there are 23 
different species. So bumblebees are cavity nesters or ground nesters. Uh, so this graphic here depicts their annual life cycle. So if we start in the spring, the queen emerges from the ground. So right now, um, she has emerged from the ground and she's starting to build her own nest. So she is out collecting pollen and nectar and building the brood cells and laying eggs and feeding the larvae. Um, and she's doing all of this on her own right now. So the bumblebees that you are seeing are most likely queens right now. Um, and then she starts to get some of those workers and the workers will start to go out and forage for her, for them. And she will eventually stay back behind in the nest and just continue laying eggs and building that colony. Then towards the end of the summer, uh, she starts producing males and those males and her daughters, so new queens, um, will emerge and they will go out and mate um, with other males and other queens. If you, that's my dog barking if you hear him, sorry about that. Um, so the new queens for the next year will go out and they'll mate and then they will find their own nest. So they'll go into the ground and kind of hunker down, hibernate uh, over the winter and then the whole cycle will start again. And all the workers um, and the rest of the colony actually dies at the end of the season. So it's just that, that queen that continues on the life cycle. So one of our largest uh, genera of bees is our adrena or our adrena or our mining bees. And they have over 1300 species. So these are ground nesting bees that have kind of a flattened abdomen. So if you can see on this far left picture over here, you can see her abdomen's kind of squished down. So that's one of the ways that you can tell that it is a mining bee. Uh, most species are uh, black in color and have kind of lighter um, colored hairs on their abdomen. Some have a reddish color, um, but many of these bees are specialist bees, meaning that they pollinate certain flowers, so they need certain pollens. Uh, if you think of honeybees and bumblebees, you see them out on a bunch of different flowers. They really can eat um, any of the pollen that's out there, where our specialist bees need a certain kind, depending on their species. And these are the some of the bees that carry pollen in their armpits. So our second largest family of bees is Halictidae, which are our sweat bees. And these are some of the most common. Uh, they also carry their pollen in their armpits, which you can kind of see in the picture on the right. You can see she has the pollen up tight close to her body. And these also nest in the ground. They are small to medium-sized bees, and they actually get their name because they are attracted to human sweat, and they use the salt from our sweat for their nutrition. And these, these bees are pretty small. So um, I mentioned that, that most bees have stingers. These are one of those where they have a stinger, and they may try to sting if you accidentally like push on them or, or hold them. Um, but for the most part, they're pretty weak and they probably won't, won't be able to sting. A genus of these sweat bees, and these I've seen pretty, pretty commonly around here is the green metallic sweat bee. Um, and they're bright green in color. Um, some of the uh, species have the like white and black striped abdomen paired with the green. It's really beautiful. Um, and these are also ground nesting bees, but these bees tend to 
kind of aggregate together. So they tend to nest kind of in a group. So sometimes they may share an entrance to the hive, um, but they each have kind of their own, um, I guess like hallway or like nest of it. And then let's see. So the next way I kind of want to highlight is our leaf cutter bees. And these are cavity nesting or stem nesting bees. Um, and so these bees are medium to large in size, about they could be depending on species, like half the size to one and a half times the size of a honeybee. So they they vary in size, but for the most part, they're a little bit bigger. Um, and they're they're common during the summer months. These bees have bigger heads to support bigger, stronger mandibles or mouth parts. Um, and they use these mandibles to cut pieces of leaves out. And then they use the leaves to like build walls in their stem nests. So if you have um, leaves in your yard on a, like a plant and there's like half circles or full circles cut out of it, it could be these leaf cutter bees. So approximately 80% um, of the bees are ground nesting and the other 20% are stem nesting. So you can see here kind of how I was talking about those little hallways. Um, this middle kind of graphic is what I was saying about the sweat bees is they may have one entrance, but it branches off into their own um, kind of nest site. And then for the leaf cutter bees, I was talking about how they use the pieces of leaves to build walls. And the picture and graphics on the right kind of explain how the walls work. So what they'll do in both situations is they will, they will go into either the ground or their stem nest and they will mix pollen and nectar together to make kind of a food like ball. And they will lay an egg on top of that, that pollen. And then they'll build a little bit of a wall and then they'll do it again. And they'll do it three, four or five times um, depending on the species and, and how long their life cycle is. Um, and they'll lay females first and then they'll lay males towards the end um, because in, in solitary bees, the males develop first. So they'll be the first to emerge and then the females a little bit later will emerge. So for our ground nesting bees, they prefer a dry sandy soil, bare of vegetation um, and, and often on hillsides, this like sunny side of a hill. The best way to provide nesting spots for these bees are to leave spots of exposed, um, undisturbed soil. Uh, maybe one part of your garden, like towards the end, you just leave it kind of bare um, and hope you know that the bees will find it and use it. Um, brush piles uh, can be helpful, or just leaving some downed logs. You know, depending on what type of yard you have can be beneficial for them to make their nests. And for our cavity nesting bees, um, most of them use hollow plant stems and then dig the tunnels. Um, in, some dig the tunnels into them uh, if they're not already hollow. And so they can use mud, leaves, um, the waxy pieces of plant leaves, um, so cellophane bees use the waxy part of leaves um, to build those walls in their nest and to kind of divide that stem into uh, cells. So, a quick yes. question from the chat. Yes. yes. In regards to those, uh, the bit stem nesting bees, do they use only native plants or will they use any hollow stem? Like a that's bamboo a good, or something. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
I am not sure. So I, I had a warning slide in there at the beginning and I took it out. Um, but I'm not a native bee expert. I have training, like I do a lot of beekeeping with honeybees and these are all things that I've learned over the years. Um, so I, I can't say yes or no one way. My assumption is being native bees, they're using native stems. Um, but there also is that kind of intervention that, that humans can do for stem nesters. And I'm sure you've seen them sold in stores. So the little like bee hotels or bee houses. Um, so people can make those on their own. And a lot of times we're using like, um, some people will use like bamboo uh, pieces. And so I assume out in the wild, they would prefer native, but if there's not uh, stems out there to use, they're gonna go to, to that house or that hotel. Thank you. That help, thanks. Okay, so bees aren't the only pollinators. So as you can see, there's about 4,000 species of bees and almost all of them act as pollinators. But there's also approximately 17,000 species of flies. So flies don't really move pollen, um, but they do move a little bit, but they're very abundant. Like there are flies, uh, flower flies and all that everywhere. And butterflies and moths are considered pollinators um, because they're on flowers getting the nectar. And so that pollen kind of sticks to their bodies as they're moving around. Um, and our other, some of our other pollinators are wasps. In some parts of, of the world, bats act as pollinators, hummingbirds, beetles, all of these kind of perform those pollination services. They're not as efficient as our bees are um, because they can't move a lot of pollen at once. Uh, but there are a lot of them out there. So one thing when you're looking at a flower and you see an insect on it is to figure out if it's a bee or a nectar visitor. So bees will be on the flower actively collecting pollen um, or nectar. And you'll most likely see the pollen on, on the bees. Um, so those are at the bottom. So notice kind of the different places that, that they have pollen on them. So we are talking about their armpits. Leaf cutter bees carry pollen on the underside of their abdomen. So kind of on their bellies. Um, the chap leg bees carry them kind of loosely on those, those long hairs on their thighs. And then the bumblebee on the right has pollen baskets like honeybees. The insects on the top um, are nectar visitors. So they're kind of hovering near the flower. They're using their tongue to get the nectar um, and they're just kind of hovering there. So those are flies and a moth. So flower flies have, they're kind of the most abundant uh, nectar visitors. So they have large eyes that take up most of their head. They have small, almost like feather-like antennae. Um, I am so sorry about my dog, you guys. Um, I am assuming you can hear him. Uh, so flies have one set of wings. Bees have two, flies have one. And they're often kind of held out at an angle away from their body. And you won't see any pollen baskets or those pollen carrying hairs on them. So this one's really fun. This is a moth that mimics, it looks like a bumblebee. Um, and this is a hummingbird moth. There's a few different uh, species out there. Um, some are a little bit more red in color, um, but this one has kind of that lack of a waist, like a defined waist. Um, 
And it, so it has like a broadly connected thorax and abdomen. It has long, straight antennae and very broad wings. And you will see them hovering near that flower with a long tongue. Woo, sorry. Um, so bees play a crucial role in pollination and our ecosystem. So approximately 35% of all the world's crops rely on insect pollination. So not just bees, but those wasps, the butterflies, flies, all of that is considered insect pollination. And 35% is approximately one in three bites of food that we eat. And 80% of our flowering plants rely on bees and other animal pollinators. So with that much pollination needed, we need to have an incredible number of pollinators uh, doing their jobs. And in addition to these pollination services, these flowering plants in turn support countless other animals, uh, as well as provide water filtration and soil nutrient uh, retention. So maintaining our bee diversity and uh, supporting our pollinators is crucial for the long-term uh, health of our ecosystem. So how can we support these pollinators? So there's five ways that everyone can help pollinators. So the first, um, is to plant bee flowers everywhere. So more flowers means more bees, more pollinators. And keeping those bee flowers clean, so pesticide free. Um, if you do apply pesticides, uh, read the label um, or call in a professional um, or when you uh, apply pesticide, um, do it in, in the dawn or the dusk. So don't do it in the middle of the day when all the bees are out um, pollinating the flowers. Uh, do it kind of towards the evening or early in the morning before they really kind of get out there uh, and start, start foraging. Um, so one and three go together um, to provide that nesting habitat. So that kind of undisturbed spot um, in your flower garden or when you're cleaning up the stems in the spring before you plant your garden, kind of stack them over in the corner um, in case there's bees living in it and they'll emerge out and then you can throw the, the stems off into the woods or your compost pile or whatever. Um, number four, collect data. So we'll, we'll talk about a couple ways um, that you can help contribute to community science. And then number five, support our efforts to keep bees healthy and on their own six feet. So one way you can help collect data is through a community science, sorry, advanced again, a community science uh, project called iNaturalist. So if you have a smart device, you can download the iNaturalist app, or you can use it on your, your PC, your computer as well. So it's an online social network of citizen scientists, uh, biologists, naturalists, um, who can help you identify what you're seeing and who use your data that you submit um, and your observations to kind of help track populations of species. So um, you can, you know, if you see a bumblebee, you can go out, take a few pictures of the bumblebee, upload it to iNaturalist, and it'll help you uh, kind of figure out what, what insect it is. So it'll give you some options where it'd be like, it could be Bombus impatiens, Bombus by Maculatus or pencil, you know, like it'll give you some species options and then you can compare them yourself um, and pick what you think that bee is. And then an expert will come in and say, yeah, that is totally Bombus impatiens um, or no, that's actually um, 
by maculatus or something. So uh, you can take your your guess at it, and then the professional will tell you if you got it right. Um, and I personally love iNaturalist. You don't have to do just insects. You can do um, flowers, other plants, trees. Um, Dr. Elaine Evans took a picture of her cat once and it told her it was a dog. So I don't know how, how, uh, domestic house pets, uh, do on the app. I haven't tried it, but, um, there's a lot of different things that you can do with this app. Bumblebee Watch, uh, is a, another app that you can use on your phone. Um, and it is specifically for bumblebees. So you'll upload your photos of bumblebees to Bumblebee Watch, um, and it'll help track those populations. So this is, if you've heard of the rusty patched bumblebee, um, it is, we have seen it here in the Twin Cities. It is the Minnesota State Bee, and it is federally endangered. So this app, this Bumblebee Watch, as well as iNaturalist, can help uh, Elaine Evans and other uh, bumblebee and other scientists uh, kind of track and locate these rusty patch bumblebee populations. So when Photographing bees, it can be really difficult because they're flying. Um, but don't be afraid to get too close to them. When they're on a flower gathering nectar and pollen, I like to think of it as like when I'm at the grocery store. So I'm at the grocery store to get food and then I bring it home. And that's kind of what the bees are doing. So they're going out to the flowers, they're collecting food and they're gonna bring it back home. So when they're on the flower, you can get a, you can get close to them um, and take a picture. So as long as you're not um, holding them or or pinching them or pressing on them, they should leave you alone. Um, and so when you're taking these pictures too, uh, for the uh, community science collection, make sure to get a few different pictures. So try to get a picture of what the abdomen looks like. Um, maybe if you can get a better view of the face, uh, those will help experts uh, better ID uh, some of those species. And if you want, you can always um, collect the insect in a clear container. So um, we use, I always call them Ziploc, but they're not Ziploc, they are Tupperware. Um, so if you have like a little Tupperware container, and you place the clear um, container over the bee, like over the flower, the bee will fly up into the container and you can gently put the lid on and you can view it through the plastic or you could even chill them on ice. Um, so bees are sensitive to temperature. So if you put the container um, on ice, it'll chill the bee down enough where you could open the container and look at the bee without it flying away. And then as it starts to warm up, the bee starts to wake up and it'll fly um, away. Okay, so I hope everyone was paying attention because we have a, a fun quiz. So we have a few minutes left We'll do this quiz quickly um, and we might skip a few because I see that there are some, some chats. Um, I'm not sure uh, question-wise what we have, but our quiz is going to be you guessing what the insect is. Hopefully I did a good enough job so you can tell the difference between a wasp a fly, a moth, and a bee. So feel free to unmute yourselves or, yeah, we might have to do a mute because if there's questions, we might cover them up um, by putting a bunch of numbers in there. So feel free to unmute yourself to say the number um, or you can guess in your head. 
but I'm going to put a picture of an insect on here. And I want you to guess if it's a wasp, a fly, a moth, or a bee. And the only rule is that you cannot make fun of others for their guess. Are you ready? Okay. Give you guys a couple of seconds. Fly. 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 It's a bee. <laughs> so this one's kind of, I guess I started out with a hard one. So the eyes are big on this bee, which I said like are usually flies. Like um, and the antennae are kind of pushed down. So you can't see kind of the long elbowed antennae. But if you look at her, she has pollen on her uh -huh. thorax here and those pollen carrying hairs. I guess I did another hard one too, because you can't see its eyes and you can't see its antennae. B. But if you look B. at its back, B. yeah, B. yeah, this is a bumblebee. Okay, so ignore the ant. The ant is not part of the quiz. Fly. Fly. Yeah, good job. That is a fly. B. Okay, what's this one? Got to be a monk. Oh. It's a fly. Oh, okay. It's a fly. I know there are some really good bumblebee mimic flies out there. So this one, um, you can see it has, it's hard to tell, but it has one set of wings. Its eyes take up a lot of its head and its antennae are very short. But it does have those hairs. Not an ant. This is not an ant. Bee. Yeah, this is a little bee. This is a little oh, sweat bee. That's this one. That's a fly. Oh, oh honey wow. bee. <laughs> honey bee. Yes. So it's a, it's hard to see with its wings, um, yeah. but there are two sets of wings there. Ooh, okay. And its hair, its hairs on it. Um, it is a honey bee. <laughs> Did someone say bee? This is a bee. This is a chaplet bee. So the ones with the big long hairs on their thighs. What's this one? Wasp. Wasp. Yeah. We'll just get that one. It's a little bit scary. That's a bee. <laughs> yeah. Bee. Okay, this one's a trick. This is a hornet. But. Bald faced hornet. All hornets are wasps, but not all wasps are hornets. I, I I haven't learned the difference, but trust me, wasps are hornets. Or hornets are wasps. See, I even I get it confused. Great job. Okay. Any questions? Yes, we've got a couple questions in the chat. Okay, cool. And that was a very difficult quiz. Thank you. <laughs> I know, I know. It is very difficult. Now imagine them like flying around and you like trying to like see them on the flower. Amazing. Um, Christy asks um, that she has neighbors on both sides of her that um, treat their lawns with Roundup and other chemicals. Mm. Does that negate the efforts she's making in her pollinator garden? I think so. So bees will be attracted to your yard because you have those flowers. So the bees, the bees should come to your yard. If you have um, like honeybee colonies, honeybees tend to forage outside of, of their, I guess, like home site. So honeybees tend to travel up to five miles. They tend to stay within two, um, a two mile radius of their hive. So if you have honeybees, you may not be seeing them in your yard. Um, but those native bees tend to stay kind of within a half mile radius. So if they're somewhere in there, they're, they'll come to your yard. Thank you. And Christy and Roberta both ask, um, are there benefits to dandelions, especially in the beginning part of the season? Yes. Yes. We at the Bee Lab love dandelions. So dandelions are the very first nectar source for our bees. So that nectar source is the carbohydrates that they need 
to have energy, to continue building their nests, to help raise their brood. Um, so dandelions are very, very important. Thank you. Um, in the very beginning, that first slide with the five different um, insects is yeah. number, um, Chad asks, is number five an anthidium? And I'm Maybe. a Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> all I know is it is a cuckoo bee. I am not sure genus and species. All right. Uh, Mickey asks, um, do you know if you should clean out the tubes in bee houses? And if you should, when is the best time to do that? Yeah, so we tend to suggest throwing them away after two years. Um, depending on the species of native bees, some life cycles last one to two years. Um, so kind of after that two year mark, after the spring, um, you can just kind of throw them away um, because there are viruses and diseases that can build up and live inside that nest. And there are some parasitic wasps that can come in and take it over. Um, so you could clean it out, but we typically suggest just tossing it. Thank you. Uh, and Chris, he asks, are any bees aggressive or only wasps and hornets? Um, I have some mean bee looking insects that are all over my hummingbird feeders later in the season. Yeah, it's okay. probably yellow jacket wasps. Um, they're, they're honeybees kind of long lost evil cousins. Um, and everyone confuses honeybees and yellow jacket wasps. Um, but it's, that's my guess is they're most likely yellow jacket wasps because they're really attracted to that sugary, um, sweet nectar in your, in your bird feeder. Or I know at the state fair, the like slushy machines and snow cone machines, um, they love it. So I wouldn't necessarily say um, that they're aggressive. Um, honeybees can be defensive of their hive. Um, so if you're standing in front of the hive, um, there are guard bees there that, that protect uh, animals and things from getting in, <laughs> excuse me, getting into the hive. Um, so honeybees can be defensive. I wouldn't say that they're aggressive, um, especially in the Midwest. Um, everybody talks about Africanized honeybees, um, which can be in kind of the Southwest um, and other countries, but it's it's too cold here for them to, to live here. Um, but for the most part, bees are, are just defensive of their nests. And that's, you know, about it. They don't, kind of go out of the way to try to sting. We have one more question before we get to that. Um, Rick is gonna put in the chat, the evaluation for tonight's presentation. If you could please take a few minutes to fill out that evaluation, it would be greatly appreciated. Also, if you have ideas for other um, webinars that you would like to see coming up, please let us know. So that, that will be in the chat. So Brenda asks, what's the difference between yellow jackets and paper wasps? Um, the way they look, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, that was kind of a silly answer. Um, they both make paper nests. Um, that's, that's about all I know about wasps. Sorry. That's okay. Um, and Christy, Christy responded says, with her that oh, yeah. bigger and thicker and appear black and white. Did it look like that last picture on the quiz? Hold on. Like that? It could be bald face hornets. That's what I think of when you say black and white. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I don't usually unmute. Um, I would say that the coloring is very similar, but it really looks like a, a fat 
fly, but it's that coloring. So I don't, I guess I don't know. I could have to, and they're you like, could. well, and oh. I usually have a hummingbird, a feeder, like off the edge of my deck because I like to watch them fly by. And I can't yeah. like, go out there once they get there because those, those bee things, because they're really, they fly angrily at you. Like, I don't know what they Do they are. sting? Because they might, maybe they're just flies. Because sometimes flies will really mimic bees where they try to mimic their behaviors too. And do some of the flies like the hummingbird feeders? Yeah, yeah. They like, you know, because it resembles nectar from flowers. And so those flower flies go to, to the flowers to get that nectar, that sweet, I guess, sweet treat, the, the energy that they get from the carbohydrates. Um, but if you want to take a picture, like people are more than welcome to take pictures of what they're seeing and email them to the B squad. So I can put the email address in here. Um, and we will identify, you know, if you send us pictures and you're like, what is this? Um, we'll do our best to tell you, you know, that's a fly, that's a wasp, you know, this is whatever kind of bee. Um, and if we don't happen to know, or you want more information on, you know, their wasps or fly like nesting or, you know, stuff like that, we, we can send that off to the entomology department and get get you some answers. I just don't know how bad I should feel if I, if I whack at them. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I guess you would feel pretty, like physically pretty bad if they stung you after you whacked at them. It all depends, yeah, like what it is. I know, okay. Well, thank you everyone for attending this evening. Uh, Brooke, thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, we thank really you. appreciate it. And we will follow up um, tomorrow with an email with uh, the links that Brooke provided us tonight, as well as an evaluation if you weren't able to get to it tonight. So with that, good evening and, and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank, thank you. you, everyone.